My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a cardiologist in York. Today's video is on the subject of heart disease and the three things that can go wrong with the heart. At first glance, the subject of heart disease can seem exceptionally complex, consisting of several different conditions, medical jargon, and very scary sounding terminology. However, when we're really examining heart disease closely, there are in general mainly three things that can go wrong with the heart that can cause us harm. And if we know this, we are able to firstly understand the different conditions better, but also get our head round why certain tests are done and what they tell us. This is important because there are many unscrupulous professionals and organisations who will offer expensive heart health tests, which really don't tell us very much, uh, but can cause us unnecessary anxiety. I will go through these three things that can go wrong with the heart and then tell you a little bit about the tests that can give us insight into them. So first and foremost, the heart is a pump and its job is to deliver oxygen rich blood around the body and to our vital organs. If the pump is unable to pump blood out, either because it is defective or because something is making it more difficult to pump blood out in some way, then less blood goes around and this can damage our vital organs and be dangerous to us. Common conditions that can cause our pump to become defective are a previous heart attack. A heart attack means that a part of the heart has died and therefore the pump has in some way become weaker. Heart valve disease. If our heart valves are abnormally narrowed, then they make it a lot more difficult for the heart to pump blood out. If our valves are leaky, then again, a smaller volume of blood comes out of the heart because some will leak back. Cardiomyopathies. If the heart muscle is in some way defective, uh, then that makes it weaker. Uh, and these include conditions like familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, familial dilated cardiomyopathy, etc. Infections and inflammation of the heart. So myocarditis, for example, was, will cause acute inflammation of the heart and therefore may compromise the pumping ability of the heart. Conditions such as high blood pressure will also make the heart work harder, and as it does so, it will become more muscular. As the heart becomes more muscular, it becomes stiffer and therefore does not fill with as much blood and therefore pumps less blood out. This is termed diastolic dysfunction. So what tests tell us about the heart as a pump? Well, the first is echocardiography, ultrasound of the heart. We can use ultrasound to visualize the heart and look at how well it pumps. This is a crude test, but it is easily available and gives us good basic visualization of the pumping abilities of the heart. A more sophisticated test would be an MRI scan because whilst on echo you will get a general overview, MRI has much better spatial resolution and therefore you can detect even smaller areas of abnormal or reduced motion, which signifies damage. In addition, MRI can actually characterize abnormal tissue and tell us whether the areas of the heart that are not moving are due to inflammation or scar. The problem with both ultrasound, echo and MRI uh, is that they both study the heart at rest and sometimes abnormalities may only be picked up when the heart is stressed. And therefore combining these modalities with a stress test can be even more helpful. And by far the best form of stress is exercise. So to my mind, a really good way of assessing the heart as a pump is a test called an exercise stress echocardiogram. With this test, an echocardiogram is done at rest to study the pumping ability of the heart. The patient is then exercised on the treadmill. And once peak stress is reached, the patient is taken off the treadmill and the heart is studied again by a repeat echocardiogram. And the pumping function of the heart at rest is compared with the pumping uh, function of the heart at peak exercise. And if the heart looks strong at rest and gets even better at peak exercise, then that is a very, very good indicator that the heart as a pump is strong. And having a strong heart is a really, really good sign. Number two, the second thing that can go wrong with the heart is actually with the blood vessels that supply blood to the heart. So you may have a strong pump, your pump may be fine, but the blood supply to that pump may be compromised. Now, with advancing age, bad genetics and bad lifestyle, 
uh, you can get accelerated wear and tear and inflammation of these blood vessels. And with time, fat and cholesterol can get trapped into these areas of wear and tear and cause formation of plaque. And the plaque can damage us in two ways. Firstly, the plaque may continue to build up and actually restrict blood from getting to the heart muscle. And this often presents with symptoms of chest tightness on exertion or angina. If the plaque gets so restrictive that no blood gets through, then that leads to a heart attack, which then damages the heart as a pump. The second way is that plaque can harm us even though it may not be particularly restrictive. And therefore the patient has no symptoms because blood can still get through because the plaque is not really causing a major obstruction. But one day, a plaque may choose to rupture. When this happens, the body treats it as a fresh wound and a blood clot forms around the plaque. And this blood clot inadvertently also has the effect of blocking the whole blood vessel, leading to a sudden heart attack. The majority of people who are above the age of 40 who die unexpectedly and suddenly do so because of a sudden plaque rupture. The best way to know if there's a plaque in the heart arteries is by a test called CTCA, CT coronary angiography. This is a non-invasive test, which is done by a CT scan, a scanner, uh, and allows excellent delineation of the heart arteries. And it's perhaps the best test to exclude coronary disease. Okay, so if your heart arteries are clean, your CT angiogram will look normal. And if you have a normal CT angiogram, then you don't need to worry about uh, heart attacks, etc for at least the medium term in the future, so the next three to five years. Uh, another test that can be done is invasive coronary angiography, where a tube is actually inserted all the way up to the heart. The tube is inserted into the wrist or the groin, pushed all the way up to the heart, and the heart blood vessels are directly injected with dye under x-ray guidance. This is an invasive procedure and allows treatment to be delivered to any suspected narrowings. However, because it's invasive, cardiac CT, which is non-invasive, is a much better test, especially if you just want to get checked out and you don't have major symptoms. Cardiac CT is now widely available, and to my mind, it is the easiest way to know about the blood vessels of the heart. And for the majority of us, the problem is going to be a problem in the blood vessels. If we're ever going to develop a heart problem, by far and away, the most likely thing that's going to happen is that we're going to develop progressive narrowing of our heart arteries. And having a cardiac CT is, especially if the cardiac CT is normal, is very, very reassuring indeed. Now, the third thing that can go wrong with the heart is an electrical disturbance. The heart is an electrical organ and occasionally the electrics can choose to malfunction and the patient may develop a heart rhythm disturbance such, uh, such as AF or SVT or VT. Unfortunately, it is almost impossible to predict a heart rhythm disturbance before it has actually happened. It can only really be diagnosed in retrospect. And therefore, people may feel a little bit insecure about the fact that, gosh, you know, how do I know if, uh, if something bad could happen because my heart will just suddenly go into a funny rhythm and that could cause me to drop down dead. If we know that the heart as a pump is strong, and the blood supply to it is unaffected, then the heart will cope well with a heart rhythm disturbance. And usually the patient will remain well enough to go to hospital and get it checked out. So even though we cannot um, predict a heart rhythm disturbance before it's happened, what we do know is if you've got a nice strong heart and the heart gets all the blood it needs, then the heart will cope even if you were unlucky enough to develop a heart rhythm disturbance. Heart rhythm disturbances are best diagnosed by an ECG during the heart rhythm disturbance, as many heart rhythm disturbances terminate by the time that the patient makes it to hospital. Prolonged heart monitoring is often required to capture the heart rhythm disturbance. Even if you're unable to catch it, just knowing that you have a strong pump and the pump has an unrestricted blood supply tells you that the heart rhythm disturbance is unlikely to be dangerous. So in essence, I would say that the two best tests to get a really good understanding of what is going on with your heart are A, a stress echocardiogram, and B, a cardiac CT, and possibly some kind of prolonged ECG heart monitoring if you're having palpitations. 
Just before I leave you, I would like to say one more thing. It is only worth knowing about something if you're able to do something about the findings. Otherwise, all it can do is generate a lot of unneeded anxiety. So if you lead a bad lifestyle and are worried about your heart, then it's only worth having these tests if you will be able to use the findings to change your lifestyle. And one could argue that perhaps you should do that anyway, regardless of the test result. But sometimes the test may provide the necessary motiva motivation that is needed. Another example may be that your GP may be recommending statins based on your cholesterol and you feel uncomfortable about taking them. In that case, knowing about the presence of plaque in your heart arteries can be exceptionally helpful, as you could argue that if there is no plaque, then you don't need cholesterol-lowering medications because the cholesterol hasn't really harmed you. As I mentioned earlier, many places offer these heart health checks, which include a blood pressure measurement and cholesterol, etc. And I'm not sure these tests are that helpful. It is far more helpful to look for harmful processes rather than numbers. And unfortunately, many of the numbers that we're measuring are actually poor surrogates for those processes that we can now directly visualize. So I hope you found this useful. I would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, and once again, thank you for all that you do for me. All the best.